Good morning, everyone. Um, can you just give me short feedback if you can hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes, perfect. Okay. Yes, um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so again, welcome everyone to our Dynamo Express webinar series. Uh, we had a a long break, I would say, um, but now we're going to continue with this series on a more regular basis. And this is the first webinar of this year. And in this webinar, my colleague, um, Anders Jonsen, uh, will talk about um, how to switch from explicit to implicit simulations. So the basic idea is that you take a model which you already have, uh, let's say a crowd crash model, and you want to use this model and in an implicit simulation, let's say, for crisis static analysis, misuse load cases, and so on. And today he will give a talk on how, what you need to consider, how you have to tweak your model in order to get a proper simulation. Um, with that being said, I want to hand over to my colleague. Ah, but before, um, a, a few comments. Um, we, like in the last sessions, we also do it like this, that if you have questions, um, post them in the chat, and we try to answer them afterwards. Okay, so just listen to the talk, write down your questions, post them in the chat, or I think we also have time afterwards to answer your questions. Uh, the thing is, um, we're going to record the sessions and we're going to post it online. So uh, with that, if you put the questions at the end of the session, um, it's easier for us um, to just cut off the, um, the questions and answers so that you, that you won't appear in the video afterwards. Okay, so with that being said, I want to hand over to my colleague, um, Anders, are you ready? Yes. Okay, so Thank you, very much. you take the ball and <laughs> share your screen. Yes. So let's see. Okay, so now you see the blue screen. Or yeah, yeah, it's the, yeah, the green green screen. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, yes. thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, yes, uh, so I will talk. Uh, today a bit about uh, going from explicit uh, simulation models and uh, sort of showing the possibilities also for implicit analysis using the same models or similar models in Einstein. So, so this is not about the topic uh, explicit or implicit switching. It's something different. It's so this is about uh, really about going from your explicit crash model looking like this to an implicit model, maybe doing a cross-static door, sag, load case, or something like that. The plan for today is uh, something like this, to start off with an acknowledgement, since I have been using public FE models, and I will talk about some backgrounds and, and possibilities uh, with LSTIN and sort of the philosophy behind LSTIN. And again, also the workflow, um, since uh, uh, I imagine that people that use Alistina in a large scale simulation environment, they have an established workflow for more or less automatic generation of models and simulations and reporting uh, for the explicit crash cases. And then how to integrate this also for the implicit. And then talk a bit about uh, implicit setup. Um, and then talk a bit about how to convert models uh, from uh, explicit to implicit, something to think about when you model, and then talk a bit more specific about an example. And then end up with some, some, some direct examples of uh, implicit load cases based on or starting from uh, explicit models. So, starting with that acknowledgement, uh, I've been using uh, public FE models uh, so that I have nice models and results to show. So, one of them is this uh, 2010 Toyota Yaris from the Center of Collision and Safety Analysis, CCSA, at the George Mason University. And it is developed under contract from the Federal Highway Administration. And it, this work is gratefully acknowledged. It's really great to have something to work with and something public that I can show to anyone. Uh, and the same with this on the Accord model, 
developed by EDAG under the sponsorship of uh, NHTSA. So it's really good that these models are out there, that they're useful, and, um, and so on. So, the background to LS Dino implicit. Uh, as you know, when you're familiar with LS Dino, uh, maybe the dominating application is within this field that explicit and metal forming. Uh, but there are so many other uh, possibilities with LS Dino. Uh, many different solution techniques for many different applications uh, are there. So, to be a true multi physics uh, uh, tool within. Uh, Many, many fields. And uh, there's a lot of uh, work con continuously going on to improve the solar capabilities and find new applications. Uh, like today, uh, we can combine uh, the thermal solver, the chemi chemistry solver, and the electromagnetic solver to, to uh, address uh, the new challenges with, with batteries, for example. Uh, and all these available solvers, uh, they are more or less uh, coupled to each other. So you could have truly multi-physics coupled uh, with fluid interaction, uh, heat transfer, electrom electromagnetics, and so on. Uh, so the idea behind the ls package is that you should be able to tie it uh, to more or less any problem within physics. So today I will be focusing on the mechanical solver and uh, mainly on the implicit, of course. So, uh, so here comes a couple of slides uh, on what I think about uh, the workflow flow and how I think it's, it's done. Like the traditional workflow, traditional approach is, I mean, for any product, you have many different uh, requirements that must be met. Um, so it's sort of easy to divide the different requirements into categories. And then within each category, you sort of find uh, the best or sort of the easiest way to, to get the results involved. So for example, within automotive, uh, I would say that this is maybe a typical layout of such a workflow that you have, hopefully, in the Dyna for crash analysis, occupant safety, maybe also metal forming in the process side. Uh, but then when you look at uh, other uh, fields of analysis, like yeah, statics and durability, you have another FE solver. And again, when you look at uh, NDH, you have yet another FE solver. So maybe here we're working with Rasta and Paramus, and this is maybe Abacus working with Zadix. Uh, so, uh, to some extent, this, of course, is a challenge. You have to have uh, different representations of uh, your product. Uh, so, what Elstina wants to offer is with this one code philosophy that you should be able to uh, solve uh, all uh, your analysis to, to be able to use one FE model, more or less, and then uh, irrespectively if it's, if it's explicit crash, you know, or if it's implicit uh, static stability, or uh, linear dynamics with an NBH to get uh, as much as possible out of the software uh, and also possibly streamlining your workflow. And then I was thinking of uh, another aspect of this could be like uh, within your organization that Steiner can sort of offer like common knowledge because uh, behind all these results and analy analysis that are being performed, you have that simulation experts and uh, analysts. And if they're all using the same tool, uh, this could make it easier to communicate and share information uh, between, between the groups. 
maybe also make it easier to create a dynamic organization since all uh, employees are familiar with the same analysis too. Could make it easier to change positions. And also, when you want to work with uh, multidisciplinary optimization, you could have uh, requirements for a structure, like in this pool. It must behave nicely. Uh, in this load case, the explicit load case free motion had form impact. You get nice ratings here, but you must also have good stiffness results and uh, dynamic properties. So that when you drive your car, you have a good experience uh, of the structure. So in this sense, you can perform uh, optimization using the more or less the same keyword file. Uh, of course, you have to change the settings to get implicit directives and so on. But the mesh and the materials and uh, the basic description can be the same. So when we come to the workflow of going from your CAD and then producing the required analysis results, uh, if you're working with this in, in a large, large scale environment, there is probably some kind of established workflow how to do this. You go from CAD more or less automated in your preprocessor. I'm happy to say ANSA here because I really like ANSA. But of course, you're free to choose your preprocessor. Uh, so you could uh, get an automated process and get your mesh and assembly. Then probably you have some, when you have completed the sub assembly, a sub system, you have some intermediate station to just verify that okay, this uh, subsystem works for an analysis. Maybe you smash it into a rigid pool or do the gravity loading or whatever, some kind of verification. And then you assemble the full car model uh, or your complete uh, model of maybe another product and subject it to the explicit crash load cases, all the requirements that has to be met. And of course, here the preferred tool is this time explicit. But if you give some more thought to it, um, you could, of course, integrate also. Uh, if you think about the, uh, the meshing and the model build-up to make the model also suited for implicit analysis, to do some more. Uh, consideration of element types and material models, maybe do some additional checking uh, to get higher quality of your model so that it could be uh, used also for implicit analysis. So, uh, because I think these processes could gain from each other that maybe the, the requirements, the demands of model quality is maybe higher for implicit. But if you use the same model for implicit and explicit, uh, I think you can gain also for this uh, in, in the explicit analysis that you have better quality in general of the model so that you could use it for both uh, crash analysis and regulatory load cases. Now we get back to this. I have some more examples of, of it. So, again, if if you're working with Elastina in a, in a large scale environment, I think your, your model will look something like this. So you have uh, sort of a modularized build up uh, with modules uh, making your uh, final analysis run. So here you have your product. Uh, in this example, it happens to be car. So the FE model consists of subsystems that like the copy Y, plus car B. Instrument panel and subsystems, doors, seats, and so on. Then you have to have, uh, of course, some kind of assembly uh, using contacts and connections, and of course, also material models. So this will sort of 
make up your graphing model. You collect everything in a main run file with control cards and database cards. And of course, for all the load cases, you have different templates setting up the load cases. And you submit to the file. So then ideally, the idea would be if you have explicit settings, and the load case is a really carrier crash. And your model does this for you. It's smash to 34 is explicit. And with minimal modifications, you have implicit settings, implicit control cards, and another load case. And this is global torsional stiffness of the car. Uh, maybe you would probably like to change the contacts and maybe also materials, depending on what type of advanced material failure models that are maybe simply not relevant uh, to this load case. You might uh, want to switch materials as well. So, but with these small modifications, you could make the same uh, FE model do this to get more results out of the same model. You can take both uh, gradient bearing crash results and the torsional stiffness of the bottom line. So the question then might be, if you're familiar with Einstein Explicit, you have a well-established uh, process for that with the control cards and, and you know how to set everything up. So this is very familiar, but uh, then maybe implicit is something new. Or slightly unfamiliar with within a style. If you're familiar with, with using other solvers, we have a situation looking like this uh, that you have. Of course, you have your model mesh, it's well known. You have the loads of boundary conditions, which are hopefully well known, and you know what simulation, simulation results you expect. And to make a Steiner do what you want, you have to have uh, some kind of control card settings. Uh, so this can then seems seem challenging, but uh, Dynamo has been working for many years to lower the thres thresholds for this, to provide a good starting point for uh, implicit control cards and implicit analysis in general. So we have uh, developed this guideline for implicit analysis using ls uh, to, to help you get started with implicit. So this is actually a SIG file uh, archive containing not only this guideline, not only this document, but also even files, small examples that you can run, maybe use as templates, and also include files uh, containing uh, control card settings. So based on this uh, guideline, you could more or less pick the control card files available and just plug them in to your analysis uh, workflow and, and get implicit results. So this is like the traditional approach uh, maybe a bit old fashioned, but you work with the uh, keyword files, text editors, and sort of more or less manually build up uh, your model. What has been introduced in, in recent years is then also the Solution Explorer in LSP Post, which also can help you to sort of get an idea of how to set, set up the style implicit analysis. Because this is another approach, maybe more modern in some sense. It will uh, use a GUI approach to guide you through the setup uh, with respect uh, to contacts and we get all the recommended control types. And so, uh, so this can be a tool uh, maybe to sort of develop a template. Uh, if you use this once and you get the settings, the control cards, the contacts, uh, and then you can use it uh, for the subsequent, subsequent analysis. As a so this is offering like a more modern approach, maybe. Uh, 
Yeah. I've also been working with plugin, a plugin for Ansa. Uh, to help you check uh, the model with respect to uh, implicit aspects. So you can get some some warnings for from your model and also help to optimize benefits according to recommended recommended settings. So this uh, guideline is available uh, for Dynamo customers. You can download it from dynamo.c and then go to our client area and we have also other guidelines uh, in this category for explicit analysis and so on. Also, the LSI keyword manual has a dedicated appendix to implicit analysis. You can also go to this and, and, and uh, use the as it is described in this appendix. Also, Dynamo uh, had a very good uh, webinar, I would say, uh, a while ago. I think it was in this uh, last autumn. So, you can uh, also look, look at this YouTube uh, clip and get some ideas and inspiration. Uh, and of course, we provide the training in implicit analysis. So, I think the next one is coming up is implicit analysis using Einsteiner in Germany. But I think now with a new situation, so so to say, it also um, opens up new possibilities of participating uh, into trainings, taking part in trainings, not only in your own co country, but maybe also uh, this next training in March from Dr. Thomas Borwell. And could be interested if you're interested could be interesting if you're interested in uh, implicit analysis. I should mention that uh, Thomas Borwell is, is the lead developer for ANSYS LST for the nonlinear implicit side. So there you could really have the possibility to uh, to meet the meet the lead developer on the implicit features. And then in this autumn, I will uh, also hopefully have a course training on on this topic that I'm talking about today. And of course, all other trainings for the sign up would be of interest. Now, I will talk a bit more about uh, uh, modeling aspects for implicit. And typically, uh, one thing that can be challenging for implicit analysis and obtaining covariance is the contacts. But here in the sign we have the very nice contacts, I would say the mortar contacts, which are developed for implicit, um, they are developed with accuracy and smoothness uh, in mind. So you can, so I really recommend using that for implicit. Uh, but you can maintain the same modeling approach as you're used to from explicit. You use the automatic CS service worker. So you use one global CS service worker. And uh, most of all, type. If you see compared to other FP solvers or implicit, maybe or you would have to define for each contact pair a separate segment set uh, and set up all possible contacts as separate contacts. But in the side, you could, in the side you could just work on as you're as you used to from the explicit side. The main difference between implicit and explicit is perhaps the requirements for model connectivity. For explicit, uh, you always will have some sort of equilibrium due to the dynamic forces. While in uh, implicit for convergence, uh, it, is, uh, it is crucial to, uh, to have model connectivity to avoid to avoid uh, uh, to avoid rigid body modes that parts can sort of without the uh, uh, without the uh, inertial forces 
And you can just translate uh, parts with really body modes, and that makes convergence very, very hard. And also, if you turn on the implicit dynamics, you could run into slow convergence if you have loose subassemblies, and especially if they start to rotate in your analysis. Um, it is recommended to use uh, fully integrated elements for your uh, analysis. And then also maybe give a uh, thought to hardening curves in general. Uh, depending on your analysis uh, in explicit, of course, you can have any hardening curve uh, that you want. Is each explicit time step is very small. You will always, hopefully, the material routine will converge. But in implicit, what can happen is that during the iterations, you might end up with a configuration uh, that it is possible, it's impossible to get back to something that is converging in case you have this type of softening or even ideal passive, the ideal plasticity. So that uh, you may, during the iterations, you take a big step in some direction and you get just get more and more plastic deformation and uh, less reduced stress. Uh, since the slide will explain these curves. So if you see hardening curves like this red one, uh, it might cause you problems for this. You can also use damage and failure models in the implicit. The question is how relevant it will be. Because when you have failure, it can be a very rapid uh, event. So maybe you can use implicit up until the failure is initiated and then switch to explicit if you want to really track the crack propagation. Uh, if you're using uh, your own material routines that you have compiled and built yourself, you have to give it a second thought as well. But there are uh, some more subroutines has to be coded to get the tangential fitness for convergence. So here comes a couple of slides on the, on the nice water contact. Uh, in case you don't know about it, it is really, really good because it sort of eliminates this uh, use for multiple contact populations. So it, can, it can capture, uh, of course, almost all. There's a small star there, but uh, for this simple example, you can capture all the possible uh, contact situations that can occur. And it is, uh, as I'll find here, it's focused on accuracy or implicit. Uh, but it can also be, of course, used for, for explicit. So this is a very good one. What you might have in your explicit model then is that you have this contact automatic general using non beams to capture edge to edge or beam to beam contacts. So I would not recommend using this contact automatic general in implicit. Just you can replace this one as well with uh, automatic single surface mortar. This it will handle also the beam. beam. So again, the uh, model when you when you're working with implicit, the model connectivity is very important. Uh, one way of checking this is to do an eigenvalue analysis. You will Visually, see that parts are then free to move, you get zero or negative, negative analysis. Preprocessor maybe have a good check for this in answer. It's this check from activity, check when to make the assemblies. You can see yeah, if there are parts or assemblies that are not connected. Uh, and of course, as always, check your tight contacts if you get the right nodes tight. One good feature is this IP back feature, um, so that you can get parts that uh, fail to be tied by a penalty tie. They can be uh, sorry. You get an additional penalty tie for for those uh, nodes that cannot be tied using the train. You get an extra backup penalty tie. Um, then okay, maybe it is connected, but then you have to have. A proper connection. 
to avoid the hinges or joints being created uh, unintentionally. Like beams connecting to solids, of course, a hinge or a scraper joint. Because uh, they know they're really body connecting to only one node of a solid, but also force a scraper joint. Joints in general, of course, uh, would be a challenge. Uh, from R11, it is possible to add some uh, joint stiffness on a global level. So if you have an explicit model with many joints, you could turn on this, like a kind of trick to make it easier to converge in, in any case, to have some joint stiffness there. And then, of course, the normal model will be checking and it should work to be done. Uh, so now follows a conversion example. Uh, how I did this, I found this uh, public FP model intended for explicit crash analysis. I think it was uh, developed initially for roadside safety, so you could uh, smash it into your, uh, your barrier. Protective barrier or structure and evaluate the behavior. But the idea was to take this one and convert it to implicit and subject it to many different implicit load cases. And the roof crash was already done. So I studied the fender loading, torsional stiffness, toe loading, door sag, door slam, and also some kind of frequency response analysis. That I wanted to do. So, as I mentioned, this had some uh, basic, very simple models, uh, mass and spring models of crash, up, crash test levels. I guess. Just to move them, I didn't think they were enough. The tires are, of course, models as modeled as airbag, as airbags. So, I simplified them a bit. Um, and then the doors were not. Were not Possible to open. <laughs> there was some extra concern of the models. In some load cases, for example, the door sag, I have to open the door. I had to model, uh, modify the model in that way. I switched the uh, global uh, contact to uh, automatic single surface mortar, but it was still one automatic single surface. Um, and this model also had some null shells on the solids. So I just remove them and mortar can have contact directly with the solids. And I turn on the IP back to get a, a penalty backup for, for the total type contact. And then more or less used you know, right away this suggested control card settings from the this guideline for the analysis. Disabling the geometrical stiffness you know, is you know, Often beneficial for convergence. Um, and I switched to fully integrated elements. From R11, this will uh, actually happen automatically. Um, so I had to do some modifications of the suspension since this model in the gravity level position. So this is maybe okay for explicit, but in implicit, we have to ramp up with the gravity and at the same time ramp up the pretension of the suspension. So I changed the springs to a discrete load curve to have the possibility to change the pretension. There were also some spherical joints in the, in the steering assembly that I guess switched because they know the weak bodies. And I also had to constrain some spinning beams in the suspension. And, and I think this is uh, an interesting example. What we see here is the exhaust system. Uh, and if you look at the exhaust system, the brow is the original one. And then it had only connection points here, here on one side of the, uh, of the exhaust system. So what happens when you apply gravity, the original system really moves down a lot. It deflects 29 millimeters. And I think this is really one, one point where the implicit model, I added some extra springs on. 
Uh, and this is also probably more how, how the exhaust system looks in, in reality, it gets closer to reality, that you are actually connecting, not, not only with springs on one side, but you have some connection on both sides of the exhaust system. And the same here, I would say. This is the cooler assembly and some tube on the side of the cooler. Uh, so this is a typical result of an eigenvalue analysis. We see that this uh, side tube is connected to the main cooler with a hinge. Uh, so this causes convergence problems that it can cause. In this case, you actually get the nice warning for this as well. Uh, from a style that you can change properly with nodes without rotation of this So a style sort of senses that something yeah, is not as it should be. Then I also added some extra constraint over the components uh, between the windows and the doors, since the rubber seals are missing. And they were very low, it was not really brought in, but it was very low fine mode of the windows uh, moving inside the doors. And that's why I side constraint on this. Harder to the structure. Here you can see, and I think this is also more close to reality. Uh, probably in in reality, you don't have to violate a fish to the top. It's probably attached more firmly to the top. So here come some examples of the load cases. When I had finished the conversion, I studied many load cases, and, and here are some of them. Full car model was used for double loading and board sag. And also a fender loading, what happens if you sit on Unexpected not only inside the car but also outside the car. Um, and then also uh, some examples of partial model results. Seating and what happens if we use the instrument panel in an unexpected, slightly unintended way. And then also uh, you could use a sub sub assembly model of the instrument panel for bus squeaky rapid analysis. In the tow loading case, uh, yeah, this is uh, also one part of using a public assembly model that I don't have. The geometry of the towing island. And this, I think, is maybe uh, in general that even though you start from one assembly model intended for crash, maybe you, would, you will have to do local mesh refinements and model specific, model specific uh, modifications, don't case specific modifications of the model, so that it is better suited for detailed specializations in some areas. And this is maybe one of those areas. The mesh resolution is maybe okay for uh, crash, but if you want to do a detailed strength evaluation, of hot plugs in this area, maybe this too cool. But again, this is something that could hopefully be also automated and integrated into the, um, uh, into the model creation workflows. So, door side loading, I open the door and apply one to the newcom at the uh, striker, not striker. Sorry, I think I'm stopping at the meeting. First, yeah, you have to load it to the And push down the door. You can see what amount of infection you get. And uh, some interesting load cases, what happens, as I said, if you sit on the car, uh, of course, you should not expect carbon deformation from, from, from this. Maybe it's not something you do any day, but if you do it, you don't have to expect to get the bond or so. Uh, so I studied two positions. Just uh, apply the loading. To the front and to the, the side. Um, 
you say in this case, there is very little um, information here. So I probably just wait for that to but I think that is to some settling of the gaps and so. Uh, and here we can just make, make some nice uh, comparisons, seeing that the uh, position was much weaker yeah, in the plastic on the side, uh, much stiffer structure. Maybe uh, just one of the quality of And here comes the quite uh, interesting low case. Uh, it was actually inspired by this low case we have. Yeah. To do uh, seeking analysis. And this is to down in the pelvis and get the force. And displacement, of course. And that's a force indication of seeking comfort, which is also a contact pressure. And of course. And then using this uh, preloaded uh, structure, we have applied the gravity loading, so to say, on the dummy, and get the preloaded structure. And I can use this uh, preloaded structure and, and do the eigenvalue analysis and also a steady state, steady state dynamic analysis to get the transfer function in between uh, the attachment point and the center point, for example. We get those sorts of uh, dynamic system properties. And um, here in this case, we see heat, magnification around 15 hertz, and then above 15 hertz, we have a lot of frequency uh, treatment uh, properties. So, uh, this is again an uh, unexpected low case, maybe. What happens if you put up a kick and push? It's also something that we should be solved. And here we can see that this initially the right foot seems has some low stiffness area and then. After a while, the stiffness is about the same on the left and right foot. And here you actually get yeah, some, uh, what is it called, some attachments, some attachment in the IPR actually in the form of plastic deformation. Uh, and I think yeah, the final example. Is this uh, bus weak and rattle analysis of the same instrument panel? We do an eigenvalue analysis and a steady state, steady state dynamic analysis. Uh, and of course, uh, this frequency dependent damping and loading is something we just made up for the example. But uh, just to show the possibilities that we can have this uh, frequency dependent model damping. Uh, and then you can use a tool in the free post to evaluate the risk for possible interaction at each frequency. Um, so this is a sort of a risk measure that is obtained, which areas here which seems to be some kind of patch, no contact in the uh, knee area of the driver that can start rapidly. And also the center part of the instrument uh, To summarize this, that uh, we can in many cases use uh, the same FE models for both explicit and implicit. But it is uh, this point. Uh, even though we use uh, Steiner for both explicit and implicit, there will, of course, be uh, different amounts of the mesh, for example. For, for the crash analysis, uh, you're maybe more interested in global response, and uh, these are detailed estimates, not global stresses. 
Point of interest why for input analysis on board, maybe after your uh, accurate stress uh, evaluation for a speed evaluation. So, but this is something that I believe can be also incorporated in that process. You have to have uh, some, some kind of uh, road case diversification that you don't want to have this very detailed. Match for stress resolution, maybe you don't want to send it into the traction. And also, this if you look more into your subsystems and do more subsystem verification for implicit, this can also lead to uh, I think increased uh, modern quality for analysis as well. If you have a higher quality uh, on the subsystems, so you get better analysis results, not only for implicit. And if you are interested in, in multidisciplinary optimization, you have known cases both for the explicit and uh, very fast events, and maybe requirements on fatigue or swiftness or high values. And then the style is very well suited for any type of optimization process. And if you have, uh, you can also maybe make. Uh, Communication easier if um, simulation and various and experts from different groups uh, use the same tool. It could make it easier to share information and experiences. And we have also provided uh, examples of where to get started. This guideline for implicit analysis can be one starting point. Uh, there are also other sources, of course. Uh, and maybe uh, it would be like starting a process and you have to build the experience for your specific needs. Uh, but I think this can be done quite rapidly if you're consistent and uh, and uh, use work in a methodic way. And it should be possible to, to implement it into your workflow. I presented some examples here. Uh, other interesting examples is uh, this one. They are a couple of years old, but anyway, at uh, the European Conference 2019, uh, present uh, in cooperation with Volvo, a root graph analysis in implicit, and also in the International Conference 2018, uh, presentation on, on the same uh, topic today. Um, so, uh, I think that was all I had prepared. Uh, I have noticed that there are some questions, but we could uh, get hand, hand over, hand back to the control, I guess. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, thank you. There have been some questions. Um, some are already answered. Ah, by the way, as a close of all, thank you for the talk. <laughs> um, yeah, yes, have, thank you very much. Yeah, um, there have been yeah, some questions. Um, I think. A few, I mean, some of them are answered already, um, but there was a last one. Um, maybe you can give you experience um, on this one. So the question is, um, when you do an explicit simulation and then you use a restart file and continue with implicit, um, here, the one who was asking, I was, um, Fang was encountering some instabilities. Um, do you have any re general recommendations on how to do, or maybe don't do this at all? Or? What do you think about this? Uh, I I don't have really tried this out myself. I have done. I mean, if you're in the same analysis, you can start out with explicit and then do explicit to implicit switching between the same analysis. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do it as separate analysis, uh, I think one problem would be if you do um, the first explicit analysis using single position, mm -hmm. then uh, all output in the sign up will also be in single position. Uh, by default, so you would get the, the box files will also be in, in single position. And then, if you start it in implicit, implicit requires double position, there could be some instabilities or American noise introduced by this, I guess. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not really that you have that out. Yeah, I think this is very difficult. I mean, what I just remember from class is that the, the main difference between explicit and implicit is that when 
it's about how, how do you request a solution to be satisfied. Like you have a momentum balance in explicit, you satisfy your momentum balance where you are right now, and then you go into the future. And, yep. But you assume that you satisfy momentum, but you never check again. That's why you have to check energies in explicit. In implicit, however, you assume or you compute your solution that you satisfy your momentum balance in the new computed state. So, and this is probably like an explicit, you can be close to the average or equilibrium state, but you, you never satisfy it. You just have to make sure that the, the energies are somehow okay. But then you switch to implicit and suddenly the implicit solver has to correct the errors ma made in the explicit part. So probably this is the reason why you somehow starting your implicit simulation, not from a, um, a, a state which satisfies momentum balance exactly enough. So probably this might be a reason, so I think. Yes, definitely. I, I would say that if you're coming from explicit analysis uh, and then you want to take this into implicit, maybe a first phase of implicit dynamics would mm -hmm. be in place. Uh, the dynamic, implicit dynamics capabilities in China are also quite nice, I think, for this type of application that you can mm -hmm. start out with 100% dynamics and then quite fast ramp down the effects to go with that. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe not possible to go from explicit to implicit static, but maybe explicit to implicit mm -hmm. dynamics. Mm -hmm. Maybe, so, yeah, sort of intermediate step. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe it's better to, to have like one deck and in the deck you switch from explicit to implicit using this uh, control implicit general yes. keyword and a, uh, and a flag associated with this. Yes, I think that, is, uh, that should work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, um, so there's no more questions. So again, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you Anders for, for the talk.